Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Um, in 1993, the world was introduced to maybe the greatest rap group in the history of music. I'm not exaggerating. That is not hyperbole. It's the Wu-Tang Clan. Since then, after numerous albums, solo projects, movies, controversies, the group remains as beloved and relevant as ever. In his new documentary, Wu-Tang Clan of Mike Cement, Sasha Jenkins gets the gang back together for trips down memory lane, explorations of art versus commerce, business versus family, and amazing, amazing footage of the group's early days. Let's take a look. I grew up on the crime side. Was no three hundred dollar Jordans. The New York Times side. We was poor, looking for a way. Staying alive was no job. It's almost like a police state, and a lot of people don't leave. Figured out I went the wrong route. And somewhere in the middle of all that shit is that hope that one of us is gonna make it. So I got with a sick tight click and went all out. Just hearing that shit on that radio. That's that shit. But I was like, we going. Project language, man. It's just the most raw philosophy. The black, red, yellow, brown, and white are all rocking with us. These five families become our wings. Who are these people? Why are they like superheroes that can rap? Check your motherfucking neck, kid. When I was younger, Thoughts was like ding 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 ding, ding, ding. like I, I can just I can see it. That was just like, oh shit. We real, we came from the same place, y'all. That is Wu Tang right there. When I think of Wu Tang, what? We political, man. We rap stars. Blend, y'all know this shit is real. Money is the root of all evil. You know how is that true? Nah, I want my whole fucking man. These young motherfuckers are standing out in New York, capture the world. Everybody, please welcome director Sasha Jenkins and from the Wu Tang Clan, Masakilla and Capadonna. Let's hear it. Yeah, yeah. Um, guys, thank you so much for being here. Uh, there's so much story to tell with the Wu Tang Clan because there's so many of you. <laughs> uh, and it's been, you know, 30, almost 30 years at this point. I think it has been 30 years since you guys started. It's been a little less than 30 since the first album came out, right? Um, so, what was it like for you compiling all of this? How did this whole project start for you? Well, you know, before I was a so-called filmmaker, I was a journalist writing about hip-hop. And uh, when I was a kid, I published with a friend a hip-hop newspaper called Beatdown. And we uh, were the first publication to put Wu-Tang on the cover. So my kind of career is in sync with, you know, their career as well. Um, I happen to share the same agent as RZA. And he explained to me that the Wu-Tang were finally ready to tell their story. Do you want to put your name in a hat? And I said, I sure do. And RZA's based in L.A. I flew to L.A. for the day. I got right back on the plane after I had spoke with him. And he told me he was talking to all kinds of production companies. Why should I go with you? And I was like, dude, you know what I mean? I, I'm like you. I grew up like you did. I understand where you're coming from. And there are things that I'm going to see that other people aren't. And it's important that folks like me and folks like us sometimes get to tell our stories. And uh, he marinated on it for about a week, as they say. And he shared with me recently that his wife was the one who said, give that guy the shot. So shout out to RZA's better half for uh, giving me the thumbs up. What was it, do you think, do you, what was it about your pitch that you think sold him and, sold him and her? I, I'm, I'm of it. I am a product of the same hip hop. You know, these guys to me are the last sort of representation of a group of guys who came up under hip hop culture, right? Like kids rap today, but we grew up writing graffiti, dancing in the street, rapping in staircases, you know? These guys are the Robert Johnsons of the culture. And so because they epitomize my childhood, you know, we were involved with hip hop before it was a business. 
And hip hop is really for us and for millions of people, it's not just music, it's identity. And, you know, bringing it back to slavery, because when you're an African American in America, you have to always look at slavery. We all have our given names, right? My last name is Jenkins. That doesn't come from Africa, right? The power of hip hop, I realized, you know, I, was a, I wrote graffiti as a kid, right? I named myself, I gave myself a name. Master Killer gave himself a name. Capadonna gave himself a name. The power of being able to name yourself when you're in an environment, you rename yourself and create a name for yourself in an environment where you have nothing. People are plugging turntables into lampposts on the street. When you think about where hip hop came from and where it is now, the idea that these guys rewrote their lives by way of how they manipulated words to inspire the way people talk, you know, I saw that firsthand. And so I think RZA and everyone else understood that. The conversations that we have are conversations. I'm not interviewing them. Right. I'm listening to them, and I'm understanding where they're coming from, and then I'm going down paths that I find interesting, that I feel other people will find interesting, and here we are. Not to get too off topic right off the top, but I'm curious if you think that hip hop being so much of the business that it is these days by and large has sort of lost some of what you're talking about in regards to these guys rewriting their rewriting their lives using language well that's always been the case with black artists in america bluesmen jazz artists have re reimagined their lives through their expression so that's not new and the kids today are doing that as well but they're not they don't see hip hop as breakdancing, DJing, and graffiti. You know, that diet that we grew up on that existed before there was money involved, right. right? That was just a pure joy of being a kid and doing these things. Like when I was writing graffiti, I wasn't getting paid to do it, as actually I was doing something society didn't appreciate. Look at all the so called graffiti artists now. You weren't trying to get a mural in Union Square no, or something. Yeah. But you look at the success of so-called graffiti artists now, no one would have imagined, just like no one would have imagined Wu-Tang, this underground group, having the influence that they had, no one would imagine a guy like Cause, who's, you know, was a graffiti artist from New Jersey, who, you know, people know who Cause is on a, on a massive level. You know, the culture, the street culture that we practice as kids without money, the joy of that propelled these guys to express themselves. And then that joy connected with this emerging industry. And as you, you mentioned in the film, you learn about their transition from the streets to corporate America, which is, can be just as treacherous as the streets. Um, the, one of my favorite aspects of the documentary is that all of you guys sitting around a theater, ostensibly watching old footage of yourselves. What was it like looking at that stuff together? It's a learning experience. You know, some things, you know, you travel with someone, you know, you can travel with someone every day. But as men, you know, we tend to, you know, we have a macho thing. We hold our, you know, our personal stuff to ourselves. So when you're looking at yourself up there and, you, you know, and you're understanding from a different angle what your brother was going through right next to you, you know, it's a learning experience as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just helped me to see how far we came, where we came from. You know, the, the things and the trials and tribulations we had to go through to to get to where we at. If Like you see on some of the clips, or one of the clips where Ray was arguing with the police, you know, and, and all the kids was out there, that was real for us. You know what I'm saying? And that it's still going on today. You know what I'm saying? So I just like to, you know, thank God for being able to, to come up, to come out of that, make the transition successfully, and to be able to move myself from those kind of circumstances and inspire other ones that's in those predicaments to do the same thing. Make better decisions. It's interesting that you say that, uh, you know, all these guys around each other traveling together and have this sort of macho exterior. One of the things that I always loved about Wu-Tang was that you guys were also really silly and that you always seemed like you were having a really good time while you were doing it, and it never felt, it never felt like it carried the macho ex as much the macho exterior as a lot of rock music, heavy metal, or even hip-hop did at mm. that time. There was something about you guys always being slightly offbeat and, and goofy, and you're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I was going to add to that. I think that's what... To be, to be 
I was that kid too. Like you're in the hood, like in those times, it wasn't cool to be into comic books. Yeah. You know, these guys, what made them special was they were confident in who they were. And that didn't change. Like, of course, they had rough times. Like in the beginning of the film, you learn that they played in a pond behind their projects. Like I didn't have a pond behind my projects, but they did. And there was a white side. You know, they talk about how there was a white side and a black side. You know, so early on... That Rizzo's, him and his brothers had four pairs of pants total. Right. Yeah. Right. So just because you're poor or just because you come from a rough situation doesn't mean you can't be silly or have jokes. And that's why I think so many people related to them because that's how it is in real life. No one's a gangster 24 hours a day. Anyone who's a gangster 24 hours a day is either dead or in jail. <laughs> so these guys were a pure representation of the totality of who we are in the inner city. And, and to me, the most important thing is they are creative and smart. But what's so fascinating about that, because they are potentially a rep or are a representation of the totality of an experience, they are often not as equally lumped into gangster rap or other sort of subgenres of rap that I think more within the popular mainstream are thought of to reflect that that environment and what your documentary does is sort of in some ways or your series does returns them to that returns Wu-Tang to the to their environment and what they were also a product of well I think in order to really understand hip-hop because for me I grew up in inner city whatever like everyone loves hip-hop that's cool but I'm listening to the music sometimes and I'm like do you really understand what these people are saying like yeah. I love Mob Deep they've got a song about how you know oh you made a mistake uh, you're not from these projects. You came here to visit your girlfriend and you had the audacity to wear a chain so we had to put a bullet in your head, right? Mm. I enjoy the song, but <laughs> listening to it now as a grown man, it's just kind of like, okay, I can still enjoy the song, but it's like what he's talking about is, a, is, is something that's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Mm. It's like a revelation, you know what I mean? We, we ministers, mm. you know, that's why they call us masters of ceremony. So it's like, the life we live, we like commentators. We the new broadcasters of the hood, mm. giving you the raw, actual facts of what's going on, how we live, how we survive, the struggles that we go through. You know, uh, we, used to, we used to hustle newspapers. We used to hustle drugs. We used to hustle uh, uh, clothes, you know? And um, those products of our environment, yeah, we was tough too, though. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we got silly. We did our joke thing, but most of the time, we was on that grind. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how we came up out of that. You interview um, Jim Jarmusch, uh, the filmmaker Jim Jarmusch in the film, who basically says that, doesn't basically say, he says, uh, as far as he's concerned, America is an apartheid. Um, were you expecting him to say that when you talked to him? What, what made you sit down with him? Well, he and Riza have a friendship and a rapport. They've worked on films together, so, you know, the fan base of Wu-Tang is broad, broad enough that a Jim Jarmusch has interesting things to say and has had in interesting interactions. And I think that's another thing that draws Wu-Tang to people. And I think there's a level of comfort that they had in themselves that is appealing to white people because white people are just naturally comfortable. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? May, okay, not white. Uh, of course, well, human, I, I I'm, saying, exactly I'm saying, what you're saying, I'm not saying in your own, I'm yeah, saying yeah. in society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? There's a certain totally abandon, yeah. and I know. I I'm, in, I'm in I a agree. rock band called the 1865 guys. Go out and cop it. All black rock band. But rock and roll has a different energy, right? There's a certain level of comfort you have being a rock and roll musician, right? If you're like a white rock and roll musician who still lives with your parents, there's a certain level of comfort. There are things you don't have to worry about when you're on the road. Mm. There are things that these guys have to worry about when they're on the road. Well, you know, so there are certain, <laughs> there are certain differences, but th those worries, there's something about their energy that has that same level of freedom that rock and roll had yeah. in the way that they carried themselves. And that's why they were relatable to so many people. There's a certain level of confidence in the way that they move. They didn't always have to prove that they were hard. You know, they could show you that they were creative and complicated and do things that, whoa, kids in the hood don't think that's cool. Don't do that. Mm. They were able to do that because they had that level of freedom and comfort that the music afforded them. Were you aware that you guys were doing that at the time when you were making, uh, when you were making the first album, the Enter the Woo? Were you, were you aware that you were doing anything that was like completely different than what other 
hip hop artists were doing at that time? Well, I think, I mean, I mean, for me, I think we was just doing what we love to do, you know, which is, which is music. You know, we all, you know, hip hop babies. I think we was just coming together for one common cause and just doing what we love to do. How you see it? Actual fact. That's what it was, you know, like the culture. You know, it consisted of all of the things that he said. It was the graffiti, the DJing, the, you know, being in the hallway, beatboxing, even dressing was a part of the culture. One time, we, no shoelaces was a style. Right. No lenses in the glasses was a style. Mm. You know, you could cut the top of the hat out, have your braids coming out the top. That was a style. That's self-expression, you know, for us, because we didn't have many ways to express ourselves. You know, even from the earlier times when we wasn't allowed to read and all of that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So we came up with our own expression, our own ways of, and creativity of creating ways to express ourselves, to tell our story. Um, we, we, we use codes, we use slang, we use mathematics, and all of that stuff. And all of that, those developments created, you know, our hip hop style and, and, and our culture and how we manifest it and how we do it. And yeah, it was different. It was different from everybody else because we, we incorporated the Kung Fu, um, the, the wisdom and the, you know, the stories and sometimes movies and all that. And then we was 10 men at one time that came into the game and was also allowed to have solo success. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know that's going way far back, but it's like, yo, that's that's what it's all about, man. We the best Monopoly players. We the creators right now, and we still creating, man, and that's how we doing it. Basically got 10 men that someone, someone on the planet can identify with anywhere in the world, you know? Was it tough early on, or at any point with you guys, did you guys argue about what the music would be, or was it very clear from the beginning that RZA would be producing and that he would be kind of the the sort of chess master of the group for a little while. I mean, you know, he, you know, he definitely the abbot of the sound. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, us just coming together and our energies just, you know, rubbing off of each other and me coming in to hear Cap spitting something fire and, you know, that's inspiring. You know what I'm saying? To just hear your brother and you see him in the booth and he's dropping, you know, something that's educational or whatever it is, but it's inspiring for you to do the same thing. You know what I'm saying? We follow suit, you know? Riz is the head. He the abbot. He definitely um, controls a lot of the sound. But when we get in that booth, we go in and we take turns spitting back and forth. It's like, my dog might not make it on there. I might go ahead and participate, but when I come back, I might not hear myself on the song. Mm. So, you know, he's picking what dart best complements the song. You also, know what I'm you, also and, you gotta be real with yourself and know, okay, if he just said something that was just on a different level, uh, no, nah, I got to erase this. This is not gonna work, <laughs> you know? So, yes. You gotta be honest with yourself. Yes. But we got yes. other producers, you know, in, in our regime too. You know what I'm saying? We got True Master, we got Fourth Disciple, um, I get tracks law from Golden Fingers, Law Mathematics, mm. Inspect the Deck Make Tracks. Right. Um, True, uh, was True Master did my first album, which was The Pillage. You mm. know what I'm saying? That was a classic album. And um, come on, man, we, we, we just, yeah, we, we the king of the beats, man. I don't know, it's, it's totally off subject, but it's funny sitting here I used to work here when this was Tower Records. Oh yeah, yeah. Me and, me and my man Mike Kaiser, we used to we used to work here. It was crazy. <laughs> it's off the subject too, but we got an A in the same spot on both of our names of ten letters. <laughs> True indeed. True <laughs> indeed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> was it um? Was it tough for you guys to watch some of that o some of that ODB footage and watch him in his heyday and even watch some of the um, some of the fighting that was going on between him, him and RZA and sort of having to remember that? Well, I mean, certain. I mean, I'm be honest. For me, I only saw the first two episodes so far. I haven't even gotten to three and four. I'm looking forward to it. But I mean, anytime you mention our brother, a son unique ODB. It's always, you know, you, we feel that. That's our brother, it's family. So anytime a family member is missing, you know, anytime any remembrance of 
anything of them. You know what I mean? It's, you know, it's a moment, you know? Yeah, we love OGD. He always with us. But we, we, we um, proud and very appreciative to have his son with us all the time. You know, he, he looked just like a man. And to me, it's like ODB ain't go nowhere. He just came back, returned to the 36 Chambers. That was his last album, right? D. Back. D. 36 is nine. He born again. Mm. Sasha, what was the toughest part about making this, this series? Well, these guys live all over the place, you know, and that's where my quote unquote ingenious idea came in to uh, get them in one place. Get them in one place. <laughs> um, but it worked out because just in the sheer body language, the unspoken communication amongst them was powerful. There's that moment where Method Man's freestyling and Ghostface, you know, reaches back and gives them a pound, this acknowledgement. And they all talk about how they were competitive amongst one another to just push each other forward. And you see that very naturally. They're just screwing around. You know what I mean? Just hanging out. Can we also say like his freestyling in that scene is better than like some of the most, some of the, <laughs> most of the mainstream hip hop that we hear on a daily basis? It's unreal how good he is in that moment. Right. Mm. But today you don't have to be, today it's more about, I was just telling Master Kill this backstage. Mm. It's like rap for a lot of kids and young adults is a stepping stone to something else. No one, these guys are from the era, they're like blues musicians. Like, I'm, a, I'm an MC. This is what I do. I'm, a, I'm gonna master my craft. Now it's like, okay, halfway decent looking kid. I got okay style. I can rap. I'm okay. But I'm trying to be an actor. I'm trying to do this. And these guys actually were the blueprint for that. Mm. Independence is very big with artists now. People are less reliant on record labels. These guys sort of forged that way in terms of staying focused on their creative vision. They launched clothing brands. They launched all kinds of things that have become commonplace now. Like if you're an artist now and you don't have some kind of deal or you don't have a clothing line, it's like, who cares? Mm. And they were some of the early architects of that. Was there anything that was off limits for you? Was I told by them that there were things that I couldn't touch in the story? No, I mean, RZA basically left me alone. These guys haven't even seen the whole thing yet. Mm. So I had the great freedom and the trust to just try to tell the best, most balanced story that I could tell. And RZA said to me, you know what? I don't agree with everything that everyone said, but I will say that I appreciate the fact that everyone in the group, every single person in the group had the opportunity to speak their piece. Mm. And that kind of shows you the complicated relationship that these guys have. They don't always all get along, but when you see them in the theater, you understand these guys are family at the end of the day, and everyone's family is screwed up. Everyone has internal issues in their family. So why wouldn't a self-made family not experience things that families in the and wild experience families, every day? Exactly. Nobody is exempt. No family or no relationship is exempt from going through real things. We just talk it out. You know what I'm saying? Whatever we going through... Whatever it is, man. Child to the lace and family matters. Just personal business. You know, we build. That's what when we say, yo, let the gods build. Today's mathematics up, knowledge build. Yeah, we got to build, man, and build and get that energy out. Whatever it is, man, and that's how we help each other, you know. And sometimes, you know, our understandings, is, it varies a little bit. And it may get a little different, but... And we, we still, are, we, 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 we still build. strong, man. Yes. Build. You know what I'm saying? And, and build, <laughs> build, build, add build, on. build means add on. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I'll pay you guys for the plug after. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, when was the when was the last time all of you had gotten together prior to in that theater? Probably one sh uh, show tour, or something, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, tour. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we have uh, two questions in the audience. Who has a question? Right here. Oh. Can you make it? <laughs> hey, then, fellas, thank you so much for everything, man. I grew up to listen to music since 92, actually, the white tape. So a uh, question goes out to uh, both of you guys. What was the best verse you guys worked on? The best the verse? verse? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Right? Wow, that's... Woo. Well, you already know, mine's was uh, probably would be Winter Wars. And mine, I would probably say, uh, into, um, meant to be a chess boxing because that was my first rhyme I ever wrote. Right, and that was the longest rhyme I ever wrote. Thank you. Of course, you know what I mean. And um, and you know what's funny about that song because when I did Winter Wars, 
A um, lot of Dark Man was on there before me. And like I was telling you before, you never know what the end result's gonna be. So I just made it, and you know what I mean? I was proud to do that. I just finished it off. I was the last verse anchor, and I came in hard. Check it out, went to Bobby, Wars. Bobby, <laughs> reach that number out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 1604-9311. <laughs> uh, All right, thanks, fellas. Uh, I'm fun. curious on on uh, on the on the first Wu Tang album, the torture sketch is now is infamous. When I was in high school and college, it was something. If you had never heard Wu Tang, you'd be like, "Well, listen to the torture sketch," and everyone would get laughing, and then you'd play them the songs, and they would sort of that would be like an amazing introduction to what <laughs> Wu was. Yeah, right. Do you guys remember that and remember putting that together and what that was like? Well, I, I, I wasn't a part of the torture yeah. chamber. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I don't know <laughs> if he was there. A lot of stuff came out of the Wu Mansion in um, Jersey, and that's where I feel like we did some of our best work. Um, what, what was the other spot? Morning Star up there, yep. up the hill, Wagner, whatever. Yeah, yeah. We did some yeah. good work. Now, the ice cream in Wagner. Up Michelle there, Court. In Wagner College. Michelle Court. Right, Michelle yeah. Court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did yeah. Winter Wars in the Wu Mansion in Jersey, but the Wu Mansion was big. Yeah. It was big, and we could all be in there together, chilling, working out, watching movies, and I could just be hitting the verse, or I could be sleeping. Somebody's doing the verse, and we, it's like we didn't have to ask nobody to get on the song, right? Because we was all there. So I think that was the best time of our recording process, you know, after. But it's interesting that you mentioned that because you're saying you're in college and you're listening to the torture skit, right? And you, so you know what they're saying. Yeah. So think about. I mean, all kids joke about things, right? But think about the hyper-violence that is inside of that skit. And then I want people to be able to watch the movie to understand where the lyrics come from, where, you know, how they express themselves, how it's a reflection of and a reaction to the environment. And so again, for me, who grew up in these environments, I still listen to the music, I, it's still powerful, but I hear it in a different way now sometimes. 100%, I hear, yeah. I hear like, Wow, some of this stuff is from slavery. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. we're abusing each other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we, we, we take pleasure in describing the ultimate level of abuse to, to outshine the other person. And it's creative. There's a lot of crea creativity in that, mm -hmm. right? But there's also another level of it. And I think that can be, if you open your ears to hip hop and really go beyond the pleasure that you get from it, because it is a pleasurable experience, there's a lot of deep meaning, a lot of American history and storytelling that has been overlooked. And that's what these guys and a lot of hip-hop artists have done. They told stories from a perspective that is often overlooked. Like the greatest subversive art, you can experience it on that young, sort of shocking, titillating level. And then as you grow older, it has layers upon layers of meaning. Yep. Yeah. Um, guys, uh, I love the series. Congratulations. Incredibly well put together. Incredibly well sourced. And you guys are just like the most fun people to watch Thank you. on screen. Uh, it premieres on Showtime. Uh, when does it premiere on Showtime? May 10th. May 10th. May 10th. Everybody give them a huge round of applause for being here. Let's hear it. Thank you. Thank you.